it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey everybody and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here and this is episode number 141 of our podcast where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them too. Don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house in historic Gettysburg, PA. Phantom Coffee Roasters. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? This is my favorite, the Kenyan coffee with notes of dark chocolate and caramel. You love your caramel. Mm -hmm. So are you ready to drink this delicious coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubbly Farms. This month, you can receive 30% off if you're a first-time buyer. I'm a longtime subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats. Orders $40 and more ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubbly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein. It's perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. This offer does not apply to subscriptions and cannot be combined with any other discounts. It's a great time to try Grubbly Farms if you haven't yet. Use the code CWTCL30 for 30% off your first purchase. Try it today. Okay, so here we are. Here we are. It's August. It is August. August, Mm -hmm. August. And again, we said August is our gateway drug. August is our gateway drug. (laughs) (laughs) Let me rephrase that. Again, we say August is our gateway month to the fall. Mm -hmm. I'm over here knitting wool sweaters and stuff. Can you do our Snuggies that you were supposed to do for last winter? Maybe. (laughs) With just like the earphone place and just our mouths open for speaking. I need my eyes. I'm sorry. I have to see. (laughs) So that we could be down in our recording studio. Well, wait a minute. How did these go from a, never mind. It's like a full body cocoon. Cocoon. Yes. Okay. It's cold down here. It feels good right now, but yes, yeah, come, come October, I know. I'm going to be like, light up that wood stove over there, baby. So how are things going over at your house? Good, good. All is well. All is well over yeah. here. Just going along summer, wishing for fall. It's all, man. Yeah. I mean, since we're getting some cooler mornings, we're getting some more stuff done outside. I'm trying to continue getting the gardens into shape and starting to clear for the duck run. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, boy. Boy, that Um, will be fun. Yes. If you're listening to our show and you're loving it, head on over to Apple Podcast and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button for two reasons. The first is you never miss an episode. And the second is it's another great way to help our show grow. If you're looking for other ways to help support the podcast, You can tell some chicken-loving friends about the podcast. Yes, you can. You can visit our Etsy shop, check out the t-shirts, tank tops, and mugs that we have there. I think we might be sold out of the watercolor mugs. Those are everyone's favorites. Mm -hmm. We're going to get more in soon. Yes. You can become a patron of the show, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Check out our levels of membership and gigantic welcome to our newest patrons. And come join our Zoom calls once a month. We have so much fun. Yeah, they're really good. Our happy hours are great. Yes. And because our content is always free, we appreciate you supporting our sponsors. You can visit our website or our show notes, use our discount codes and affiliate links, and buy products from all of our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the Chicken Love Box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the Mega Box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the February box, I absolutely love the red iron rooster trivet and the seed block. I really love that egg timer. It's going to be great when I'm baking. And those chicken stickers are going to be awesome on notes I send out. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. 
Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals Health Products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery, defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. I need some green eggs and ham. Green eggs and ham. I need some green eggs and ham. Yeah, it's the Breed Spotlight. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. If you can guess which chicken we're doing for this week's Breed Spotlight. Can you guess which chicken we're doing? <laughs> we're the, doing the olive agar. Green eggs and ham. Yeah. I mean, I get the green eggs, but where's the ham coming from? I don't know. It would be green eggs and veggie ham for you. Yeah. And it would not be ham for me. I don't eat pork. So. Well, then what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> it just, it's Dr. Seuss. I just love it. Okay. Okay, so yeah, Olive Agar. The Olive Agar is a, it's kind of a quasi-hybrid breed. We'll explain that in a bit. But they started showing up in North America, becoming very popular in the past 10 years or so. Yes. And we're calling them quasi-hybrid because they are a true hybrid by breeding. But they are not the same as the super layers that are created by genetics companies that we usually refer to as hybrids. Right, because they're not laying a ton of eggs. They're bred this way for the color of their eggs. Right. So purely. And, and they do have some things that carry through through generations. So they don't breed true for an appearance, but they breed true for their purpose. Correct. So quasi-hybrid. These birds are called olive eggers because of the color of the eggs they produce. They're olives. They're green olives. Sage green, army green. You can get some really beautiful shades. You can have some speckles too, which are great. Yeah. Now the color is the result of a blue egg being overlaid by brown pigment in the hen's oviduct. And it has to be a dark brown to get some of the colors. Yeah, to, to really make that shade. For more on this amazing process, go back and listen to episode 28, which I, I think is a really good episode. Oh, yeah. Now, to make an olive agar, one of the parents, see if we can follow this, if I can do this without messing up. To make an olive agar, one of the parents has to have blue egg laying genes. Right. That means it must be an arcana or a blue egg laying breed that was developed from an arcana. So that would include leg bars and Americanas. Correct. The other parent has to be a dark egg layer. So you're looking at Morans, Well Summers, maybe Barnevelders. All of our faves. Mm-hmm. There is no set mix for this parent stock. Breeders generally have their own practices. What happens is you can pick any of these chickens because they all lay the same color eggs and then mix them up and get the same result. Right, right. My pet chicken, for instance, breeds two mixes. One of their alivegar mixes is leg bars crossed with Morans. Correct. And the other is Americanas crossed with Morans. So they do offer both olivegars and I love these, partridge olivegars. Oh, yeah. And they definitely look to have some cream leg bar heritage. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you'll hear these terms. You'll hear about F1 and F2 olivegars. Yes. And if you don't know what this means, and I had to way back in the day, look this up as a refresher because high school biology was a long time ago. Oh, yeah. So an F1 hybrid is also known as a filial one hybrid. That's the first generation of offspring from distinctly different type of parents, i.e. two different breeds. Correct. The F2 is a cross between two F1s. Correct. So it's just second generation. It's just the next line down. And that's how, if you think about it that way, it's easier. And like we said earlier, this works in olive eggers because they're bred for color of eggs, not for production. And not for quality or characteristics of appearance. Right. Sta- the, right. The standard, is it's, it's a practical standard rather than an appearance standard. Exactly. Well, that oversimplifies things because, you know, heritage breeds are, their standard has to do with a lot of different things. But what we're saying is in this case, 
It's specifically the practicality of egg laying. And this chicken, it's all about the color of the egg. That's 100% right. what it's about is it's in the name of the chicken. And the reason we say quasi hybrids is because again, they can go to subsequent generations. Right. Now, the golden comet, which we spotlight back in episode 60, the golden comet are production hybrids that are always F1. Right. There's never a second generation of exactly. them. Exactly. Golden comets can only come from two specific parents. Right. If you're interested in olive acres, you might be wondering why would you breed a combination of F1s and F2s? Would you do that? Because it would be fun to have a different appearance and still get the green eggs. That's one good reason. Exactly. Another reason is because F1s have a 1 in 1 16th chance of laying a brown egg instead of an olive egg, right? They do. F2s have a nearly 100% chance of laying olive eggs. Exactly. So if you can get to that point and your breeding is good, you might be able to produce even more olive eggs. Now you're asking the question, is it possible that to crossbreed this bird too much? I don't know. It's hard to say. It is. I mean, right now, they're crosses of heritage breeds for the most part, and they're probably benefiting from what's called hybrid vigor. Right. It would be interesting to see someone who started a dedicated breeding program with some sort of a standard to work towards. Right. I don't know the answer to this question at all. I don't feel like, one, I don't feel like I'm an experienced enough breeder, but two, sometimes these things take on a life of their own, and it's hard to predict. So sometimes you can get what you think is an olive acre, mm -hmm. and it turns into be a Gertie Well Summer. Well, that's because the chick was in the wrong bin. But I think that that hatchery must have used Well Summers. Oh, that's possible. And somehow that's how that happened. It could be. That's possible. That was my thought. Once we figured out she was a Well Summer. Well, at first we thought maybe she was just one of that one sixteenth that, that was laid a brown, brown egg. egg. But she is completely a well summer oh yeah and lays the terracotta eggs just like well summer right. with speckles and that was the big joke story from a long ago that gertie was bought thinking that she was an olive egg and i'm waiting and waiting and waiting for these green Ain't eggs no olive egg happening no so i ended up <laughs> thinking that and again to refresh everyone she was the only one in the bin that looked the way she did oh, that's because she was a well summer i'm like did did they use parent stock were they well summer and somehow and while Summer Ray got in there, you know? I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. Because she, they could have been using that what for hatchery? the dark. Mount Healthy. Mount Healthy. Okay. She was from the mill. From the mill, right, right. Okay. So, you know, you just don't know. So let's look at the appearance of the olive acre. Mm -hmm. They generally have straight combs, mm -hmm. may or may not have feathered legs, may or may not be crested, may or may not have beards and muffs. I guess all of these are possible depending on the parent breeds. Exactly. So because they're hybrids, they don't breed true. They have no breed standard. Right, right. So they can be any of these things. And that's why I held on to the dream. The that, hope. The, that Gertie was an olive acre. Because I'm like, <laughs> come on, come on, come on. So their appearance is very, very widely. Yeah. Many of them are on the darker side. They Correct. tend to be like brown, black, or blue. Yes. I think they're super cute birds. I really like them. They are. And the fun thing about them is kind of like the Americanas, like you don't know what you're going to get. Right. You can have a difference in appearance mm -hmm. that one looks completely different from the other one. Th and that's kind of fun. Yeah. That is kind of fun. I always call it the grab bag of the chicks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it's a good thing. So let's look at their size. They tend to be a little on the medium to larger side, six to seven pounds for hens. When you start to get to seven pounds for a hen, that's a little it's larger. It's getting bigger, yeah. It's getting bigger. And seven and nine for the roos. They are bigger. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. think about a well summer, they're bigger. Yeah. Some of the other chickens. Lake bars are not. Morans are. Morans are. Mm -hmm. And barn of elders are a little on the medium to smaller size. And Americanas, I feel like, are on the smaller yes. size. I mean, I think a lot of the modern olive acres that we're seeing have Morans blood. That explains that size. Yeah. That or the well summer's bigger too. That's true. Okay, so hens are going to lay about 150 to 180 of those gorgeous green eggs in various shades all year round. Not great on the number, but that's not why you get them. You get them for those beautiful green eggs. I would imagine this varies with individuals too. It you has know, to. Some of these birds are going to be laying more than that. That's about three per week. It's mm -hmm. pretty good for a family of four or five, mm -hmm. you know, if that's what you want. And many of them will go broody, so they will sit on a clutch mm. of eggs for you yeah. if you want that. If you want that, right, right. Yeah. 
They have a reputation for being generally calm and friendly birds, great for backyard flocks, great in mixed flocks. They're bred for colored eggs, not egg production. We can't say that enough. But that means they tend to have a long, a longer lifespan than a lot of the production reds and sex link hybrids. Which is a really good thing. Mm-hmm. So they will live longer for you. Right, right. They are good homestead birds in many ways. They make really good pets. They satisfy that need for the rainbow eggs for your basket. We have read that the roos are kind and friendly and are quite nice to have around. Right. If you've had a different experience, let us know. Heat or cold hardiness. Now, that's going to depend on the individual bird's appearance. Right. So if they have those big combs and wattles, you're going to need to protect them. If they have the smaller, I say this every time across the board, protect them all. Yeah. They all get cold. So, but for heat purposes, if they have a bigger comb and wattles, it'll be, they'll be better in the heat. Right. On average, I think they probably tend to be larger birds, and so they will probably do better in cold than heat. Right. So you're definitely going to need fans and things to keep them cool. And like we've been saying lately, the weather patterns in the U.S. and actually the whole world lately have been crazy. Oh, so yeah. So it's not a bad thing to have some fans or maybe a couple of cozy coop heaters stashed in storage in case you get some kind of freak. We have them. Cold or heat spell, yeah. Okay, so here's the thing. They're easy to find. Mm-hmm, very. Like I was talking about, I went to my local farm supply store and they had them on a special day. My daughter picked the one that looked different out of the 50 in the <laughs> bin. So it wasn't an olive acre, but the bin said olive acres. I can't say that one enough. Mm-hmm. And they're widespread. You can get them everywhere. I quite like them and I like what they look like. I would not be sad to have olive acres. It's one that I could definitely see in my mm-hmm. flock. Like you've always, if you always ask me, I'm like, yes, I tried to have one in my flock. Well, I know when you got spicy, you were hoping to get an olive acre that day, but Joe was like, Rhode Island Red. I want a Rhode Island Red. So we got spicy, but I wouldn't trade her for the no, world. She's I awesome. love her. She's awesome. Okay. So you know what I'm going to say next? If you have the olive acre, and I know there's a lot of people out there that have them. Mm-hmm. We want to see those pictures flooding in on your stories. Mention us on the story or... DM us with your pictures and we will give you a story. We want to see your chickens. We love seeing those pictures. So my, don't stop. My other bestie, Michelle, was ordering olive acres for this year. Apparently, there was a shortage at the hatchery. So she was given a couple choices and she went with what I think is the best speckled Sussex. Yeah. You can't go wrong. Oh, you can't go anyway, wrong. So still, none of us have olive acres. olive acres, but that's okay. They're awesome birds. I can see one in my flock. Yeah. If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from Nestera.us. For a 5% discount, use the affiliate link in our show notes, on our website, and on Instagram. Link in bio. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We personally use Roosties products with our chickens, and we're huge fans. They have their awesome nesting pads, do-it-yourself feeder and waterer kits, and they've just released their best product ever, a new chick feeder and waterer set. They have adjustable legs to keep food and water clean. They're super well made and the feeder even has a removable lid so it can easily be filled from the top. So if you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, all their products are available for prime delivery on Amazon.com. Check out the Roosty store on Amazon or follow the link in our show notes. So we're ready to move on to main topic. Yeah. 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 Now we're going to do a main topic this week that we get countless <laughs> so many questions all the time questions comments everything about mites and lice mm-hmm. mites and lice are a problem like holly i was saying with globally the weather doing crazy stuff there's going to be more of these things out there to deal with yeah they're they're just they're nasty little buggers there are several types many types of mites and lice that can plague your chickens i have this really bad habit where i say Lights and mice. <laughs> you do. And I say it all the time. So the most common in the U.S. and in other countries that have temperate climates, the most common mite you're going to find is the northern fowl mite. Oh, yeah. In warmer climates, there's a tropical fowl mite that is often present. Yuck. And mites will feed on different things on your chicken 
depending on their species, which just gives me the willies. Right. So some are going to feed on blood. Some are going to feed on dander. Some are going to feed on feathers. Some are going to feed on scales. If you can't tell what you have and you do have the luxury of popping them under a microscope, mites are eight-legged and lice are six-legged. Yay. I'm already itchy. I know. It's so much fun. Mm -hmm. So, and if you have a question that you don't know, you can always go to your doctor, your veterinarian, and they can do a little scrape of the skin and put it in some mineral oil and look at it under the microscope and even show you and identify the mite or lice that way. Yay. Oh, I'm so itchy already. So the northern fowl mite, this is one that I had once or twice in my 20 years of chicken keeping. Yeah. Uh, while birds carry this. Right. And they're always coming in and out of the run, I feel like. Oh, they do. They do. The northern fowl mite feeds on blood and a heavy load of them can make your chicken weak and anemic. It can even lead to death. If you see these on your birds, you need to treat them. Now, another one we're going to talk about is red mites. And red mites are way more prevalent in the UK. Yeah, they're not one we commonly have here. No, we do not commonly have here. And we have an episode, episode 65, Mm -hmm. where we talk, I believe, with Libby all about red mites. Mm -hmm. And it's a great episode if you're over in the UK and you want information on red mites. If our UK listeners, I'm sure, are familiar with this, but... Red mites live on coop surfaces. They will feed on chicken blood at night. They are the vampires really of the mite world. Nasty little things. They should have been on Twilight, the movie. Of all of these, the one that I have, oh my God, I just got that. It just, woo, I just got that. Um, of all of these creepy crawlies, this is the one that I've had the biggest fights with the common chicken louse. And they get them from wild birds also. Yes, they do. They will feed on skin on blood, on feather debris, and dander. They are larger than most mites and quite visible. Right. I was going to say, and you can see them with the best time to do it is when it's near dark and you put a headlight on and look down and you can see them moving. And that's the case for pretty much all of the lice and mites that live on the body. Yes. The red mite's a little different. But again, go back and listen to that episode because Libby gives you really, really, really good ideas for diagnosing them. Now- Let's talk about another really common mite, and Mm -hmm. we tend to get a lot of questions about this. Yeah. And we're going to clear up treatment for it right now Mm -hmm. when when we talk about treatment, but it's the scaly leg mite. Ooh. Okay, so they're going to get under the scales of the feet and the legs and eat on that dander that's under there, under the scales. And then what's going to happen is you're going to see your chicken with pushed up scales on their feet and legs. A really bad case, you'll see all kinds of like crusty stuff coming out from under the scales. Right. It's not good. It's gross. The feather chewing mite. With this mite, your birds will start to have very messy looking feathers. They actually look chewed or they might look broken. Ugh. These mites can irritate and cause broken skin on a bird. So you'll, you'll see folks say feather chewing mites will never cause anemia. They never ingest blood. That's not true. There's blood in the feathers. Feather up, you know, when you have- I don't know if they get down that far or not, but the thing is they will irritate the skin and break the skin and they will feed on blood or- It's not good. It's it's really nasty. I mean, I am so itchy right now. I'm almost like moving in my seat. I'm so itchy. So- you suspect, you you think you see little moving dots on your bird or something else is going on. You suspect this. What's the best way to diagnose lice and mites? Okay, so I was talking about it a few minutes ago. You want to use a headlamp. This is the best way, even better than a flashlight. If a flashlight's all you have, it works. But the headlamp is all oh, Because your hands are free to yes. move the feathers apart. You want to do it when it's just about dark or dark. So that you're going to shock these mites when you shine that light down on them and they're going to move. They don't like light. Right. They hate it. So that's why they go to the darkest, warmest places of the body because they hate light. What we recommend is put a headlamp on, go into your perch and take a look at your bird and start around the vent. If you can't do this for whatever reason, grab somebody that can help you and find a tabletop Mm-hmm. Where you and someplace you can dim the lights and use that flashlight. Exactly. So you're gonna look around the vent and you're under gonna, the wings. You're gonna look around the vent and then you're gonna look below the vent on the stomach. Yep. A lot of times if you have lice, they will lay their eggs there and they look like these kind of gray cement casings on the edges oh, of the fat on the I'm on the itchy. The, <laughs> I know. I'm gonna say that again though. They look like these sort of gray cement casings on each feather shaft. 
You can look under the wings, look up in the tail cushion, right? especially on the really fluffy breeds. Sometimes, too, around the neck. Neck feathers, yep. Is another place that you're going to look. I am itching my... I'm itching everywhere right now. You also look around the face. A lot of times, the really tiny mites, you'll see them around the eyes or on the red skin on your bird. Now, I don't want you to... Okay, my, my chicken's missing some feathers, especially in the summertime. It's definitely mites. Don't make that assumption first. No. Mm. Always check because we're finding with the weather patterns that some of the chickens are molting early this summer. Yep. Absolutely. So don't always jump to that conclusion and say it's definitely mites. I will not treat a bird for mites unless I have found mites. And see them. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So where do these mites come from? We're going to answer this question. There's carriers. They can come from other chickens. If you bring in a rescue, this is a good reason for quarantine. A lot of times chickens coming from bad situations have lice or mites. Right. So if you bring in a rescue or a chicken from another farm, Mm -hmm. you could bring the mites in. Right. Wild birds. We've said this before. Wild birds carry these. Rodents do as well. So you want at night to pick up all that food and water Mm -hmm. so you're not bringing the rodents into where they are. They do not need the food and water out at night with them. Right. How do you treat the mice and lights? It's a magic medication called... Ivermectin. Ivermectin, yes. There are various treatments. This is the one we go with because this treats the bird quickly. There is, I believe, a 10-day egg withdrawal. That is nothing compared to getting these mites off your right. your chickens. And there are some other products. There's one called Elector SP. I've never used it. It's expensive. It's very expensive. Some people swear by it. I know some of our friends in the South where the weather doesn't get that chilly are really fond of using the Elector. So we can't really comment on that one one way or the other. Just know that that's a possibility. Now, if you have scaly leg mites, not you. Holly Ann does not have scaly scaly leg mites. But if your chicken has scaly leg mites- Not the last time I looked anyway. The easiest way, and even Dr. Rebecca, we were talking to her Mm -hmm. not too long ago about this, is slathering those legs with a boatload of Vaseline. And what that does is suffocate the mite. Right. And it kills them. Yes, it's a petroleum product, but if you have to treat multiple birds with this, it is the most cost-effective solution. It works. It does work. It's worked on one of my chickens before. Not only does it smother the mites, it also, if it's a bad case, it also helps to loosen all that crusty stuff. And soften the scales Mm -hmm. back. I think it must be soothing, too. I think it's very soothing. And there are a lot of worse things that you could use. Well, yes. And we want to address something. And just put it out there so that you don't think that this is a treatment. For the love of all that is holy, please do not dip your bird's legs in gasoline. That will kill your chickens. Please don't do it. And here's the thing. There might be some folks out there who have used this treatment and and they have killed the mites. I'm sure they killed the mites. And the bird survives. But there are a lot of chickens who have died for this. Just recently, we had someone come to us. It's so sad. And she had lost some chickens from doing this. And she was so upset. And, you know, she got this information thinking that it was what she should do. And it's not. So if you're listening to us, please never use that treatment ever, ever, ever. Vaseline is amazing for scaly leg mites. And I do Vaseline and ivermectin for scaly leg mites. I have just done Vaseline. It works. But Mm -hmm. if you want to be extra careful... Some ivermectin will help take care of that also. And the Vaseline, again, depending on the case, you're going to want to do that every couple of days. I was doing it like every day, every other day. I I would do every other day And then you see, you'll know it's working because you see the black waste of the mites coming out. starting to come out, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so ivermectin, let's tell everybody just, should we Mm -hmm. tell everybody how many days we do it? So it's a- Sure. So you do it first and then- You do it every seven days for three treatments. Okay. So what we put on our calendar at home, we'll do it on the 1st. Right. We'll do it on the 14th. Right. We'll do it on the 28th. So you do three treatments and it's about 0.3 mLs. It's about 0.3 mLs. And you don't inject it. You put it on the skin. Right. So the ivermectin you're going to use is injectable ivermectin. But you don't inject it. But you don't inject it. You use it topically. Yeah, ivermectin's a tricky one because almost every parasite out there, with the exception of the topical parasites right. and the meningeal worm that ruminants can get, almost every other parasite is resistant to ivermectin at this point. The only one that I don't think is, and this is in the small animal world, uh-huh. is ear mites. Okay, so, well, that's another topical, right? No. So it gets injected into dogs and cats for ear mites. 
Right, but I'm saying ear mites are a topical. Oh yeah, they're just a regular mite like that gets in the ear. Well, that's what I'm saying. That for internal parasites. Oh no, you, it does not right. work for an internal. It's, it's used topically. Yes. Mange, mange is another one. Sarcoptic mange. You in, inject for that too. You inject for yep. that. So mm-hmm. ivermectin, like in kittens, you'll see the big ear gunk that they have, yeah. and you'll get under the microscope and you find the domestic ear mites and they're there. Yeah. You inject it. With chickens, you're just putting it on the skin. On the skin. Now, if you have intestinal parasites inside the body, you're going to use different dewormers. And you're going to put it on the skin right up between the wings, like what would be our shoulder blades. So they can't get to it. And the ivermectin will move through the skin follicles. So for everyone out there that has dogs and cats, if you use Frontline, mm-hmm. this is the same premise. Yeah, yeah. So it goes from hair shaft to hair shaft and covers the skin. Poultry DVM, Kelly at Poultry DVM has a nice information sheet on this where she does talk a bit more about dosage. Right. And depending on the size, like a big roux, I'll give 0.3. Yeah. Standard size hen, I usually give 0.25. Right. Something like that. So I would check out her dosage. We're not giving dosage information because we're not veterinarians. That's just what we use. That's what we use. Exactly. Okay. So once you've treated, you're going to always clean out the coop 1 million percent. Scaly leg mites will move from bird to bird on the on the roost. On the roost, but they need to be feeding quickly. Right. The rest of those buggers, you need to make sure you get them out of the coop too. Yeah. So, you're taking care of your bird with ivermectin and vaseline if it's scaly leg mite, then you really need to strip the whole coop. Right. And again, that's where some people use Elector SP. You can use a pyrethrin based spray and make sure you spray everywhere including crevices. And then once you spray, the entire coop has to be 100% dry before the chickens go back in. Right. And really, it's a good idea to dry it and let it air out anyway. You don't want them to inhale that at all. And then you're going to put your bedding back in. And, right. you know, you can add some actual natural mints and different things, some different herbs. Yeah. So herbs in the mint family are natural, naturally repelling. Pennyroyal and mountain mint are both really good. Another good one is balm. So you can get lemon balm, citrus balm. Mm-hmm. They're also very repellent. Mm-hmm. You can also spray one of the natural sprays. A lot of them have clove oil. Right. You can diffuse some mint essential oil. Prevention, one of the biggest p- things you can do for prevention is to always have dust baths available for your birds. Right. If they get one mite on them, they're going to bathe it. It's going to take care of it. And in your dust baths, you can put wood ash, which is great for smothering mites and diatomaceous earth. Right. Why do we not use diatomaceous earth as a cure once your bird has mites? It won't kill them. <laughs> it certainly will not kill enough of them. No. If your bird has a real infested, like if your bird has three mites on her, She'll take care of that in a dust bath. Right. You won't ever see a problem at right. that point. If your bird has an infestation, diatomaceous earth is not going to kill enough of these mites right. to get the infestation under control. And here's the other thing. If your chicken is so uncomfortable from the mites that there's sores, there's everything else, it's time to go to the doctor and get some medication for the skin. And if you feel like you don't want to treat them, your veterinarian can treat them for you. Right. And it's true. Mm -hmm. So just keep an eye on them. But having a good dust bath does take care of the stray mite that might land on them. Absolutely. Doing things to repel them. The wood ash is a really big thing. Wood ash in their dust baths is fantastic. It's really good. It's Mm -hmm. good for them. So those are all the creepy crawlies. Mm. It's pretty simple. They're pretty simple to treat. If you think about it, the way that we have it laid out. Unless your infestation is like crazy, crazy. And, yeah. and red mites a whole different. We know for our UK listeners, red mites a whole other kettle of fish. Right. And that's why we have episode 65 where we talk with Libby over in the mm-hmm. UK about red mites. So you might want to listen to that one. I really do like the idea of either spraying something like clove oil in your nest boxes before you put the bedding in. Yeah. Or go with some of the other herbs. I'm not a fan of, in general, of most of the nest box herbs. I feel like they draw ants and bugs because they're so sweet smelling. I prefer like the pennyroyal and the mountain mint both have this sort of menthol smell. Right. Or the sharp citrus smells. I think those are the way to go. I've tried them a long time ago, once or twice. Commercial nest box herbs. And I got ants in there Mm -hmm. because they were just so sweet that the ants were drawn to them. And I was like, yeah, no. (laughs) Okay, so... If you hear, if you listen and you still have questions or concerns, we are always here, never too busy to answer your questions. Just email us, 
DM us on Instagram or Facebook. And as soon as we can, we will answer you and try our best to help you. We are here for our listeners 100% of the time. Okay, so let's move on to cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. Now, we sat in Dr. Rebecca's office. We did. (laughs) And brainstormed this recipe Mm -hmm. while Ivy was being treated. Right. We talked about Ivy last week. So it was getting my mind off of things. And we were like, let's brainstorm recipes. Mm -hmm. And this is one that we brainstormed while sitting there waiting for Ivy to get treated at the vets with Dr. Rebecca. It is so good. So this week we're talking caramelized onion frittata with summer veg. This thing uses a lot of eggs. And we got a lot of eggs right now. It's also very easy to make gluten and dairy free. And it's delicious. My neighbor came over the other day and I said, Oh, do you want some eggs? She's like, sure. So I ended up sending her home with like three dozen. Yeah. Amy, my other friend came over. I just given her two dozen last week. I'm like, do you want another dozen and a half? She's like, sure. Take them, please. Please. We have so many eggs right now. It's so crazy. Many, so we so need many. recipes that use lots of eggs. Yes. This one is great for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Mm-hmm. And it's a great one when you have your bestie over to make quickly for lunch or to feed the family for dinner. So let's look at the ingredients. It's kind of in the title, but we're going to do two (laughs) onions, peel and slice into thin rings. We know that I can't do thin rings, so they're going to be chunky or half rings. A generous splash of some olive oil. I find it easier to cut the onion in half and then do thin half moon shaped rings. I I find that works much better for me. Somebody had this hack they were using where they took, it was like a pick of some sort, like a hair pick, but they never used it on anybody's hair. And they pushed it down instead of fingers. And it held the onion still. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're going to use eight of your large eggs. Eight. That's good. Two small zucchini or one medium sliced into thin rounds or half moons. And zucchini are some of my favorite summer veg. Mm -hmm. A cup and a half of cherry tomatoes. I always half mine. Mm -hmm. A tablespoon of balsamic vinegar. Salt and pepper to taste. And a half a cup of shredded Gruyere or shredded dairy-free cheese. And Gruyere is one of my favorite cheeses. You know what? That's one of the few things that I could cry tears over not being able to eat anymore. It's so creamy. And nutty. Yes. Oh, it's so good. And then a quarter cup of shredded parm. You always need some parm. Okay. (laughs) Do they have a dairy-free parm? Yeah, actually, yeah. There are a couple brands that make dairy-free parmesan. Okay, so let's talk about what you're going to do next. You're going to heat a skillet over medium heat. I like a hefty skillet for this. You're going to add a generous splash of oil. Swirl it to coat the pan. Once your pan is warm, you're going to turn the heat down to say medium low. Add those onion slices and my favorite, thyme leaves. Yeah. I love thyme in there. My thyme's doing really well this year. Mine's still dinky, but it's doing well. And I would, I think I would use a cast iron, but that's just me. I don't have any cast iron. Well, I know but, I'm getting you for your, for your Christmas gift. But yeah, my mom always does hers in cast iron. So you're going to Cook the onions, stirring often for about 10 to 12 minutes or until they're soft and just starting to brown. You're not going to do the full cook right now. And everybody wants to tell you they're going to get brown in like three, four minutes. Does not yeah, happen. No, they're not. No, they're not no. Does not happen. So they're just going to be starting to brown. They're not going to be fully caramelized yet. You're going to add the zucchini and tomatoes and a pinch of salt and continue to cook them, stirring frequently until the onion is golden and starting right. to caramelize. The zucchini will have softened and the tomatoes have cooked down. It's going to give you that onion, that sweeter taste mm-hmm. if you wait. You're going to stir in the balsamic vinegar, salt, and pepper to taste, and you're going to set all that aside. Oh, that's going to go in your eggs, man. And now you're going to do the eggs. So mm-hmm. in a large bowl, you're going to whisk all those eggs with a pinch of salt. Once they're well blended, you're going to add all the veggies and scrape. Scrape to get all those bits out of the pan. Yeah. I mean, I suppose you could deglaze the pan if you really wanted to. Yeah. It might make it a little too watery. It might. So you're going to scrape all everything in you can manage. You're going to add the Gruyere cheese or your dairy-free cheese. Stir it all together. Just grab that same skillet and wipe it out. Spray it with some nonstick spray. Spray it well mm-hmm. with nonstick spray. Put it back over medium heat. Preheat your oven broiler and make sure you have an oven rack that's up right. at least halfway or up in the top. Right. When the skillet's hot, you're going to add another splash of that olive oil Swirl it around, pour in all the egg and veggie mixture, and let it cook undisturbed on medium heat for like five minutes, six minutes, seven minutes until the eggs have started to set right. on the bottom. That's very important. You have to wait to move it until the eggs are set. Yes. You're going to sprinkle the top with the Parmesan and transfer that whole skillet to the preheated broiler and broil it usually three or four minutes. 
Broiler tip. Watch care Watch your broiler. <laughs> your broiler always works faster than you think it's going to work. Yeah, mine. I have a really sad story about Big Alaska and my <laughs> broiler. <laughs> so three or four minutes, whatever. But again, watch it. Until your frittata is cooked through in the center, you do want to cook through. And you can use your little cake tester. Mm -hmm. Yes, I yeah. use it for everything because I love my cake tester. Yeah, you can. If I don't have a cake tester around, I'll just use a knife and cut the middle and see what it's yeah. doing. So you want to cook through in the center, getting golden brown on top, like your cheese is nice and melty. You're going to let this thing sit for a few minutes after you take it out of the oven, just to firm up the rest of the way. Yes. Then you're going to cut it in wedges and serve it. Another important tip is... Don't try to do a shortcut and just put your veggies in the egg uncooked and cook them all together. No, it, it does not taste the same at all. Your veggies have a lot of water in them mm -hmm. and they will water your whole thing down. So you right. have to cook all the veg first to make it all work in the end. Just that. But Well, it concentrates the flavor. Right. It really makes a difference when you cook And them. then you serve and then you could serve it with a side of greens. I like it with a big salad. Yeah, a big salad and you have a meal. That's high in protein, great in veg. You go to your local farmer's market and get your veg. If you don't plant them yourselves, mm -hmm. that's fine. You know, in fact, one of my favorite farmer's markets ever is in Baltimore City. Uh, that's the one where I used to sell yarn. Yeah. And you know what? I love farmer's markets in the city because it enables everyone absolutely to get their produce. Baltimore has a lot of farmer's markets in many of the neighborhoods. Oh, yeah. And they're usually quite reasonably priced. They're reasonably priced. And then that way, people who live in urban areas are all within the walking distance of the farmer's market and can go and get their fresh produce to make these recipes. Right. Try it. You might like it. You can send us pictures of yours. We would love to see them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's move on to retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. yeah. This week's retail therapy was one of Holly's favorites. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're talking vintage chickens from Hazel Atlas. The Hazel Atlas Company. I love Hazel Atlas stuff. I love, they're really known for glasses. Yes. Yeah. The Hazel Atlas Company was the result of a 1902 merger of four different American glassmaking companies, most all of which actually were formed in the late 1800s. They supplied glass products and glassware. They had factories in several different areas, but they were headquartered in West Virginia. Okay. Close. Interestingly enough, they did hire a lot of women workers for both the factory and the office. Nice. But they would give a woman who got married her two weeks notice as soon as the wedding was over. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They would not hire married women at all. Why? Because they were afraid they would get pregnant and then I, they wouldn't be able to work? I guess so. So, like, I love this company, but here I was uncovering all this stuff. They didn't hire people of color at all except for occasional janitorial positions. Oh, my God. No married women. So this all changed, though, during the Second World War. Thank God. Because they desperately needed a labor force. So Hazel Atlas is known for pioneering safe food processing, and for making the first mayonnaise, pickle, and baby food jars. Yeah. I mean, because they're all about glass. Some of their designs, I mean, I was scratching my head that they don't employ married women. I get that. I mean, they're up until the 1980s, there were still big companies in America who were that way. I think that they're just afraid they're going to get pregnant, then they're going to have to, they're either going to lose them when they have babies, or they have to pay them for maternity leave. Right. But, you know, there we're not laws. in the cave times here, people. There, there were laws that helped this along. Anyway, it made me scratch my head because so many of their things were so directed at married women. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, they, we won't hire you, but we want you to buy all of our stuff. And that's just a little historical that They're going note. after married women to buy the stuff. Right, that's what I'm saying. That's their target audience. So oh my God. This is the kind of stuff that when you do histories, you uncover sometimes. And I still love Hazel Atlas stuff. I do. It's, this, it's the truth. You know, it, it happened. So the company had begun making one of their most popular offerings. This is the milk glass hen on a nest dish right around 1930. It's a beloved one. It really is. It's a smaller hen dish. It's like a bit over four inches long. Are those the ones I use next to my stove for salt yes, and pepper? and I use one on my bedside table. So they're a, Hazel Atlas. Yeah. I did not even know that. I've told you that before. I forgot. I've told you that repeatedly. <laughs> well, I probably forgot. I forgot repeatedly. 
Yeah, I have one on my bedside table that I keep my rings in and earrings. Yeah, my uncle gave me those too, and I mm-hmm. use them for salt and pepper. I love them for yeah. that. We're calling them milk glass. That's how it's referred to. Yeah. But it's actually this, I'm going to get this name wrong. It's opalite or something like right. that. It, it looks like what, mm-hmm. milk. And I think it's a pressed glass. They're made by press, pressing the glass somehow. Anyway, this little dish is about four inches long. It's completely white. You can usually find this hen from like 5 or $10. There are lots of them around. They made, I mean, oodles of this. Yeah. They did make a hen dish who's similar with a red glass comb and waddles. And they also made some other solid color, transparent glass hen dishes. Okay. Like there's a transparent amber colored one. Those are often called candy dishes. Okay. So, you know, they have a couple of different variations for hens on nest. When you look at hens on nest, you probably, they all look like candy dishes. Yeah, uh, yeah, when you really look at them. Well, that that small one, the the little milk glass one. Yeah, she's probably a little too small to be a yeah, candy you dish. Could, yeah, but she could other, be an M M&M and M dish. She could be an M M&M and M dish. <laughs> that would be it. Chocolate chip dish. Chocolate chip dish or yeah. salt and pepper dishes. Why I use them next to my stove. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Hazel Atlas also produced some really wonderful Depression era and mid century kitchenware and dinnerware, some of which featured chickens. Yay. They are very collectible if you can find them. A lot of these are more on the rare side. Like you can find the hens on the nests. Right. But this stuff is harder to find. It's definitely harder to find. In the 1960s, they made some really wonderful large glass drinking tumblers. Right. With, there are a couple different patterns of roosters. There's one that has roosters and eggs printed on the sides. Absolutely (laughs) love it. They also made mid-century coffee mugs. Mixing bowls. Spice bottles. Cocktail shakers. And this made me laugh. What is an actual poultry waterer? Wow. It's just the he- the glass part of it is Hazel Atlas. Now, Hazel Atlas are also the ones that do all the etched glasses. Yeah, they, they do a lot of etching. So mm-hmm. your barware. Mm-hmm. And they have them in the cool caddies, which I collect. Yes, they do. They have a lot of them in caddies. So if you see a glass set in a thrift store that has a caddy or on eBay, chances are it's Hazel Atlas. I got a couple Culver's in Culver too. Yeah, is another one. But the Hazel Atlas, they they did some really pretty glassware. And I have multiple sets of the caddies that I like to bring out if I'm just having a dinner party or something because I think they're so cool. And well, different. they look great too. Yeah, they're, they're really just nice. cool to have out. So some more rare items from Hazel Atlas: rooster printed milk glass canisters. Nice. These are more pricey too. And where you're going to find these more is online versus in the wild. Yeah, if you find them in the wild. Grab them. Yeah, and run. Grab them. Most of Hazel Atlas stuff is marked on the bottom with an H and an yes, A. Yes. Most of it. Also, something really rare I found that's super cool. Farm scene snack sets. Oh, I want them. Yeah. It's a clear glass. It's a farm scene painted on. There's a rooster on top of a grain silo. Want them. Really neat. The pitchers. They have some pitchers that go with some of their glassware. There's a couple of them that are chicken or rooster pitchers. Very rare. Very fantastic. And egg cups. Okay. That was super rare, the egg cups. If you're fantastic. finding this stuff, run. I mean, get it, get it, Take get it, get it. Run. it. Yeah. So that's Hazel Atlas. I love Hazel Atlas. You can't Atlas. go wrong with it unless you were a married woman in the 1920s Prior to trying to work for it. I mean, honestly, that history is probably more companies than not. Oh, yeah. But thank it's God just, we've evolved. Yes. You know, and we know our worth. Yes. So, okay. So if you have Hazel Atlas, we'd love to see it. Especially chicken Especially Hazel Especially their chicken stuff. Send us some pictures. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Of course. Next week, we are spotlighting the Isa Brown. We kind of have a theme that's going to be going, and you'll get it in you'll, a second. You'll get it, yeah. Main topic, everything you need to know about rescuing chickens. Yay. Well, this doesn't fit the theme. This is just really, really good. <laughs> Cracking the eggs, we're doing blackberry mint cupcakes. You can't go wrong. Well, the mint in them might repel some mites while you eat them. Yeah, off of your rescue chickens. And instead of a retail therapy, we're doing a rescue spotlight. We are talking about Hen Harbor. It's amazing. Okay, so what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. And kiss them too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com 
slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.